Mark Twain was born and died in years when Halley's Comet was in the night skies. What's more, he predicted his death. He said, I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It's coming again next year, and I expect to go out with it. It will be the greatest disappointment of my life if I don't go out with Halley's Comet. And you know what? That came true, and it's come to have been seen as great prescience on his part. But here's the thing, Twain was already 75 when he made that uh, announcement, which was a good long age for the early 1900s, and he was a writer, so of course he thought of that. Would we have remembered it if he had lived into his 80s? No, we wouldn't. Prophecy can be like that. We remember the predictions that came true, not so much with the failed ones. Jesus' words about the destruction of the great temple in Jerusalem may have been a bit like this. All four Gospels talk about Jesus' prediction of the fall of the temple, although John takes it way off into the stratosphere, talking about the resurrected Jesus as the new temple after the earthly temple is gone. Still, scholars believe that Jesus might well have said something derogatory about the temple. And you know what, that's what we remember. Given that there was great unrest in the reason, and the Romans were crack, cracking down really hard on the local populace, and the temple had been destroyed before, it wasn't a really hard call to say that the temple might be attacked again. And we also need to remember that the Gospels were written during or after the time that the temple actually did fall in 70 CE. So if Jesus said that the temple might fall, his words were seen as even more memorable. Remember that thing about predictions that actually come true? For me, I'm not so sure it matters. What matters is that Jesus said disaster was coming and his followers needed to keep their hearts and minds on him. Disaster was coming, and they would be okay. Disaster was coming, and they mustn't be afraid. Of course they wanted to know when all this was going to happen and what they should do to prepare. Jesus just said, trust me. He said, I will give you the words and the actions you need to survive. God will make a way out of no way. He'd already given them each other. He told them to stick together and help one another. In the scripture Jesse read last week, uh, preached on last week, he told them that God is the God of the living, not the dead, so keep your eyes on life. A lot of the time we can't begin to prepare for disaster. Not too surprisingly, I've been thinking that a lot, about that lot, for the last two weeks because the anniversary of the campfire was coming up and then happened and was passed. I've been thinking about where Bob and I would be without friends. Minutes after I began to realize that we were likely faced with a huge crisis, I was Facebook messaging with Jesse, who said, come here. The Bethany room is more than big enough for you guys and your cats. So we had a plan as we were spending five hours coming down off the hill. We didn't have to totally panic because we had a place to go. Two weeks later, Gary and Cece offered us their fifth wheel. And we lived there for a few weeks while we looked for some place to buy in Chico. A childhood friend offered a condo in Sacramento where we could stay while that house that we bought was actually being built for as long as we needed it. We had offers for housing from a cousin in Granite Bay and an old colleague of mine out in Massachusetts who was pretty sure we didn't want to move back to the snow, but nevertheless, there was a place there for us. Friends and relations bought huge amounts of gift cards, which we didn't really need, so we were able to donate them to the church to pass out to people who really needed them. People wanted to do something. Laptops and Kindles appeared for us. 
the most important thing that was done for us had nothing to do with stuff. People listened. They reached out and said, tell us your stories. We were so lucky. I talked to other people who had folks who just wanted them to suck it up and get over it. You know, our stories made them uncomfortable and they didn't want to listen. Believe me, your willingness to listen was the most important gift you can give to somebody who's traumatized. Someone once asked the anthropologist Margaret Mead what sign she looked for to decide if a collection of ancient peoples living together constituted a civilization or just a group of people who banded together for safety and improved hunting conditions. Perhaps the questioner had in mind a tool or an instance of decorative art or something else, but Mead's answer was that she looked for evidence of a healed femur, that some member of a group had broken the long bone in their body and it had healed. A badly broken leg takes a long time to heal, and the person attached to that leg can only survive if somebody else feeds them and protects them. They can't hunt or fish or run away from enemies. A person with a broken femur needs someone to take care of them. So a healed femur indicates that someone, perhaps the whole group, helped that person, protected that person rather than abandoned them, which would, of course, be the sensible thing to do. And that's what makes us civilized, according to Mead, taking care of one another, living in community. Jesus tells his followers that they will get through the coming hard times. He tells them he will give them the strength and the words they need. He tells them that no matter what they might think, they have enough. They are enough. We are enough. With Jesus beside them, with Jesus beside us, we can survive. We can perform miracles of love, of healing, of reaching out to others. At the onset of disaster, we can only respond at the lowest levels of need. Can I get myself to safety? Can I find shelter, food, warmth? Having others reach out to us to us and offer these things pulls us out of immediate disaster mode and reminds us that we have friends, we have family, we have community, we have a God who treasures us. At that point, we can begin to breathe, to choose how to respond to unfolding events. We can begin the long, hard work of resurrection. I can't thank you all enough for being here when I was in need, for showing me who you were, and for reaching out, because we do get to choose the kind of world we want to live in. And we have to do our best to make that world a reality. At the Disciples Women's Retreat a couple of months ago, I was reminded by the speaker of a story that I had heard before, one of those that I had set aside and said, ooh, I'm going to preach on this someday. It is a story of listening and reaching out. The writer is Naomi Shahab Nye, and these are her words. After learning my flight was detained four hours, I heard the announcement, if anyone in the vicinity of gate 4A understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate 4A was my own gate. So I went there. An older woman in full Palestinian dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing loudly. Help, said the flight service person. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be four hours late, and she did this. I put my arm around her and spoke to her haltingly in my broken Arabic. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. 
She thought our flight had been canceled entirely. She had to be in El Paso the next day for some major medical work. I said, no, 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 we're fine. We'll be there just late. Who's picking you up? Let's call him and tell him. So we called her son, and I spoke with him in English. I told him I'd stay with his mother until we got on the plane, and I'd sit with her if I could. It was a Southwest flight. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons, just for the heck of it. Then we called my dad, and she and he spoke for a while in Arabic and found out that, of course, they knew 10 people in common. Then I thought, you know, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her. This all took up to about two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, answering questions. She'd pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts out of her bag and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the traveler from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. And then the airline, the airline broke out the free beverages from huge coolers, non-alcoholic, of course, and the two little girls for our flight, one African-American, one Mexican-American, went around serving us all apple juice and lemonade, and they were covered with powdered sugar, too. And I noticed, I noticed my new best friend, because by this time we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag some medicinal, medicinal thing with green furry leaves, such an old country traveling tradition. Always carry a plant, always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones, and I thought, this is the world I want to live in. Once the crying of confusion stopped, not a single person had seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all of those other women, too. This can still happen anywhere. Everything is not lost. And that's the end of Naomi's story. Not everything is lost. In fact, if we work at it, much of what is or seems to be lost can be found. But it does take all of us, at least attempting, to work together. Because resurrection doesn't mean we're ignoring what happened before. We may still be wounded. We may never be fully healed. But we are transformed by being held by Jesus and being held by one another, by being told that we are precious in God's eyes. Before we get sober, or forgive our enemies, or find housing, or whatever it is we really ought to do. We are precious, no matter what. One of my Facebook friends posted in May that she had visited her old property up in Paradise. She said, I stopped by today to say hello to my dogwood tree, because I love that tree. I wasn't sure, but I thought there might have been a few very tiny struggling buds. I touched the bark of the trunk and spoke reassuringly. It's OK. It's OK to bloom, bloom again. The fire is gone, and you're OK. And then I realized I was talking to myself. We are enough. We are all enough. And we are all broken, even those who look so good on the outside. We need one another always. We're all going to approximately the same place, and we're all on a path. Sometimes our paths can converge. Sometimes they separate, and we can hardly see one another. But on the good days, when all is said and done, we're walking on the same path, maybe even holding hands, close together. And as Ram Dass has said, we're just walking each other home. Amen. <laughs>